I have a dream, and I don't. I'm not the only one with this dream. Uh, it comes from the World Health Organization, which is to eliminate cervical cancer. This is the James Cancer Free World Podcast. I'm Steve Wartenberg, and my guest is Electra Paskett, a world class cancer epidemiologist. Electra is director of the Division of Cancer Prevention and Control in the Ohio State College of Medicine. She's associate director for population sciences and community outreach and co program leader of the Cancer Control Program in the Comprehensive Cancer Center. And she is also the founding director of the Center for Cancer Health Equity at the James. Electra and her team have created several statewide initiatives that have saved a lot of lives through education, prevention, and screening, and vaccination programs. And she was recently awarded the very prestigious Cancer Prevention Award from the American Society of Clinical Oncology and the American Cancer Society. Welcome back to the podcast, Electra. Thank you very much, Steve. It's great to be here. Congratulations on your your big award. I understand Thank you. that's is prestigious. Really, is the the right word? It, it is. It is in the cancer prevention control world. It is. Yes. Thank you. So that means you're one of the the superstars of <laughs> cancer prevention. I, I can say that. You don't have to say that. I don't have to say that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. The, the award says it. Yes. So let's dive right in. What is an epidemiologist, and why is this field so important in all fields of of science and medicine, but especially for cancer? There used to be an old joke that um, epidemiologists would say, no, I'm not a skin doctor, because people think the epidermis, that means skin. But no, I'm not a skin doctor. So what epidemiologists do is they study epidemics. That's if you break down the, the, the word. So the epidemic I study is cancer, and there are many different uh, areas in epidemiology. Infectious disease epidemiology was one of the first areas that epidemiologists study. We've seen a lot of that lately. And lately, yes. Yeah. Um, cardiovascular epidemiology, for example, and behavioral epidemiology. So I am uh, actually a behavioral epidemiologist because I design interventions and test them to get people to do what they need to do to reduce their risk of developing or dying from cancer. You correct behaviors. I try to yes, correct right. behaviors. Some, yes. yes, sometimes it yes. can be hard. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Wow, okay, so that real okay, that's fascinating. You correct behaviors because as we know, certain behaviors doing things or not doing things can increase your risk of cancer. Absolutely. So, for example, my colleagues uh, design smoking cessation interventions. I I don't do smoking cessation myself. I work with them. Um, But I do things like, how do you get people to get mammograms, pap tests, colon cancer screenings, HPV vaccinations? Those are the types of interventions that we design to try to change that behavior. Now, before we get into that and some of the specific programs, what attracted you to this field back in your college and post-college days? Right. So I tell this story. Ever, ever since I've been a little girl, I have always asked the question, why? And it used to drive my mother crazy. <laughs> and she used to say, because why is crooked? <laughs> she would just get so exacerbated you know, with me keep asking why. And um, asking the question why is the perfect uh, question for an epidemiologist. Or a journalist or podcaster. Or a journalist, or right. A or a po- yeah, that's right. A detective. But, yeah. but we understand why. What causes disease? Um, and what? It, why does this happen? And then what can we do to fix it? That's the part I do. I don't stop at the why. I, I stop then, well, what can we then do about it? But, but before we get to what can we do about it, why, why do you think why was so important to you? What is it in your personality or your environment that made you want to always know 
why things were the way they were and how I'm things worked. I'm a questioning worked. person, and I, <laughs> I love murder mysteries, you know? So find out the who done it and the whys is really part of who I am. And so when I, you know, I graduated in biology and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I worked for five years in an anti-convulsant drug development lab. And then one day I was reading a graduate catalog, a graduate school catalog, and um, I saw epidemiology and I read about it and I thought, oh, that's exactly what I want to do. So then I um, applied for the master's program got accepted, really loved the work, excelled at it, and they said, um, you know, you, you need to get a PhD. So then I went to the University of Washington and uh, just happened to be at the right place at the right time, landed uh, with a graduate research assistantship on the first cancer prevention research unit in the country at the Fred Hutch. And uh, that's how I sort of landed then into more of the intervention development. So that word, intervention and prevention, are just so important. I don't think people realize that there are so many ways to prevent getting cancer. And, and what's the expression that, that so many of you at the James say, the best cancer is the one you never get. And so t talk about why that is so important. Well, I mean, I guess it's obvious, but and then how? Right. So... I'm sure you've talked about this on your podcast before, that, that cancer is not cancer is not cancer. There's over 200 different right. types of cancer. So when we say prevent cancer, we really have to be more specific in terms of which cancers can you prevent. Right. Some can be prevented. Some, some can. Some you can catch early. Some you can catch early. Right. So um, the biggest thing is um, when we think about tobacco use. Yes. That... Uh, can, if you don't use tobacco or you stop using tobacco, that can prevent lung cancer and a host of other types of cancers that are related to tobacco. So that that is a real big one. There. And heart disease and, and, and all the heart kinds disease, of, all kinds yeah. of diseases. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then um, people talk about things like diet and exercise, which are really a lot harder to get people to do. But we know that there are several cancers, about eight or nine, that are related to obesity. So that is ex extremely important. Then we have um, infectious agents. For example, the one that we know a lot about is human papillomavirus. It, it causes six cancers. Um, and for that one, we have the human papilloma virus vaccine, the HPV vaccine, which is now approved for ages 9 to 45. I should say it is approved. It is recommended 9 to 26. 20, 26 to 45 is with shared decision making between the patient and their physician. But, but a person up to age 45 could get the, the HPV vaccine. Now, now, we've talked about this before, but there's some misconceptions and wrong information out there about that HPV vaccination, and I know that's frustrated you over the years, so dispel some of those miscon misconceptions and tell people why they should have their children vaccinated at that early teen years. There's a whole host of misconceptions. So let's start with the first part, the HPV. So human papillomavirus is a sexually transmitted disease that uh, up to 80% of sexually active people will, uh, will get, will contract at least once in their lifetime. What makes the virus cancer-causing is if it stays in your body and doesn't get cleared. And, and so what can help protect against the virus setting up house, let's just say that, in your body, is to get the vaccine. Now, with cervical cancer itself, there's a lot of misconception. Um, a lot of people think that only promiscuous women get cervical cancer. That is not true. My mother, her first cancer was cervical cancer. My mother certainly was not a promiscuous woman. And um, I think we do a lot of disservice when we yeah, think... Married monogamous women, women can, get, can get cervical yeah. cancer. Yes. 
Um, and and I, I really think we do an injustice to women in general by thinking that. And um, the other thing that people think is if we give children the HPV vaccine, that is a green light to have sex. Right. That is not the intent of the vaccine. First of all, it is a cancer prevention vaccine. And um, second of all, there have been studies conducted that showed there is no increase in sexual activity um, among those teens who were vaccinated. So that is a myth that has to be totally dispelled, done away with. And what is the percentage of eligible people that have gotten the vaccine? Well, so gotten, uh, what do we mean by gotten? So it's a series vaccine. Uh, if you're under 15, you can get two. 15 and older, you need three. Shots. So, shots, sorry. And so, you know, a lot more people start it than finish it. Oh, uh, okay. So we're under under 50% uh, for the completion, which is not good. We need to be up to 80%. A lot of missed opportunities. The When the vaccine was rolled out, um, it was recommended to be given with the, the um, age 11 shots, 11, 12 shots that children usually get, the Tdap and the meningococcal. So this would just be bundled with that. And children get bundled vaccines all the time from the time that they're infants. Um, the, you know, the other part I want to just say a couple of words about is vaccine. And with COVID, there's yeah. really been a great wave of um, anti-vaccination sentiments and, um, you know, I, I feel bad about that uh, because we in, it now in the 22nd century, 21st century, we don't have the infectious diseases that our ancestors had to live through. And the main reason we don't have a lot of those infectious diseases is first, improved sanitation, refrigeration, but vaccines. Right. And now we're seeing exactly what you just said about this anti-vax sentiment that's growing. We're seeing measles outbreaks exactly. where there shouldn't be. Exactly. And, you know, the same with, with the COVID and measles, you know, all of these, we could really lower the baseline in the population if we would, would get vaccinated. There's nothing put in the vaccines, you know, <laughs> let that some of the myths are promulgated about that. There's nothing put in them. If, if we could nothing just remember. Nothing bad put in. Bad put in put yes, in. yes, that's what I mean. The good things The good in. things, <laughs> right. And they have been tested for safety. Um, and, you know, if we could just remember the polio days. Yeah. I mean, I, I got a polio vaccine when I was a child, but but it wasn't too long before I was born when people still got polio and it was devastating and the way we you know pretty much reduce that is through vaccination and um there's there's a lot of mistrust we we just need to trust people you know i've gotten now the covid shots and and the boosters i've had five and yeah five i'm okay i'm here you know so um they are safe so the same with the HPV vaccine. It is safe. And in the United States, we now have a nine-valent vaccine, which means that it will protect against nine different strains of the HPV uh, virus. Oh, okay. And, sev and reduce your risk for six different cancers. Correct. Wow. Another one of your titles includes the uh, cancer health equity, and that's a... a, a a topic that's getting more and more discussion for, for the right reasons lately. So what does that mean and how does that then apply in, into what you and the James do here in, in the, all over Ohio? Right. So when I came here uh, a little over 20 years ago, we set um, up a program which uh, soon morphed into the Center for Cancer Health Equity. And our goal is to reach into all populations in our catchment area, which is the state of Ohio and understand, identify, understand, and address the factors that are causing differential health outcomes in terms of uh, cancer. Differential meaning differences that should not exist, which is another way to say disparities. 
So we seek to achieve health equity to eliminate cancer-related disparities. So a disparity would, would be the percentage of women that get mammograms? A disparity would be in outcomes. So we know, for example, that black women, not only in the state of Ohio but nationally, um, have higher death rates from breast cancer than white women. That is a difference that should not exist, and that is a disparity. Now, I was going to save this for later, but since you brought that up, you are addressing this uh, through a, a statewide program funded by Pelotonia. So tell us a little bit about that program and what you hope to accomplish. I believe it's it's begun and is in the early stages. So uh, uh, we have a program that's called Turning the Page on Breast Cancer. That is our hope, to turn the page on uh, this disparity in black women uh, for breast cancer. We are in 12 counties in Ohio, the counties that have either um, highest rates for mortality for black women for breast cancer or high percentages of um, uh, female black residents. And we're doing um, um, a multi-level implementation study. So we're seeking clinics in those 12 counties to work with, to partner with, as well as community organizations. So we, we go into the clinics and we say, all right, tell us how many of your black female um, patients get mammograms. What's your goal for, for mammography? It should be 80% or older or over. What about referral to genetic counseling and genetic testing? What about um, assessing risk for cancer? Because women at higher risk for developing breast cancer maybe should have MRI added to their screening. Women at higher risk would be women with family history? Correct. Correct. And, um, and then if you have a woman who has an abnormal mammogram, do you make sure she gets followed up? And where do you refer people for treatment? Is there a delay in getting treatment? So we, those, the, And those questions are sort of the crux of the areas that we're focusing on. Uh, so uh, that's sort of at the system level. And in, in the clinic that we uh, work with, we then will do a CME, uh, commu Continuing a Medical Education Program with the physicians, and go through all those areas. And, and then we help the individual clinic develop procedures to identify women who need a mammogram, who might have an abnormal and need follow-up. Uh, we work on referral patterns. So for example, one federally qualified health centers, center we worked with said, you know, I would love to, to refer women over to OSU for genetic counseling. But what number do we call? And so we set up um, a referral process, uh, a clinic workflow for referrals to genetic uh, counseling and genetic testing. And uh, the, they're really excited about that because now they have a, a number and a person that they can call to, to get help really quickly. So I'm curious, with that ge with ge genetic counseling, that's to determine if... if a woman may have the BRCA so, gene? So first or... of all, there's counseling to explain what the testing means and also to go through your family history and your risk factors. And then it's the woman's decision if then the, the, her history uh, and risk factors indicate she might. Right, okay. Have, then, then, then she's offered genetic testing. Yes. And if it is positive that, they ha that this woman has the BRCA gene, which greatly increases your chance and can be passed on, you need to know that and get more counseling and more counseling. And then there are there's a surveillance system that can be implemented. Extra surveillance. Extra surveillance. That woman exactly is right. probably going to get cancer. Exactly right. Let's catch it early. Right. Right. There are some myths that we've found about genetic testing, um, and we are addressing in our. Um, present, educational presentation to the clinicians. Uh, insurance will cover will cover that. There's some misunderstanding about that, and the costs have significantly lowered since they were first implemented. So that's a couple of key points that we um, remind the physicians of, which they're grateful for. Um, 
Then uh, I want to talk about an exciting thing that we added to the Turning the Page on Breast Cancer, and that's our website. Okay. And so anybody can go to the website and um, learn about breast cancer, learn where you can go in your respective county to get a mammogram, for example. But we also have a risk assessment online risk assessment that women can complete. And once they answer the seven questions, then there's a personalized prescription that is generated and shown on the screen. And it it will tell you, um, well, based on your answers, you're at normal risk for breast cancer. You should begin getting mammograms at age yada yada and you haven't had one yet so you should talk to your doctor about scheduling a mammogram you can go to the resource page to find a place close to you and if you would like to talk to a navigator please click here oh good okay so that they That's can you. leave a message for our navigators who will call, call them back right what what is that website and breastcancerohio.org and breastcancerohio.org Yes. Okay. Women out there listening, please check in and, and take that test. Right. That, that would be great. So that's the main vehicle, you know, we're, we're pushing. And then we uh, also work with community organizations in the counties uh, to uh, attend health fairs, et cetera. So this is just one of the many statewide programs. So we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll go through a couple more of these big statewide programs. Several of them, I'm happy to say, are funded by Pelotonia. And also, let's talk about your wish list. What's next? What's down the road? I know you're always playing in three, four, or 50 more things to do to help more, more and more people. So I'm looking forward to hearing those too. You didn't choose cancer, but you can choose where to treat it. And when you choose the James at Ohio State, you're picking a team of experts who understand there is no routine cancer. You're opting for care from a highly specialized team dedicated to treating one type of cancer, yours. A team that studies the unique makeup of your disease to develop a personalized treatment plan. You're choosing our region's only comprehensive cancer center designated by the National Cancer Institute. Where more than 1,700 scientists are working on new treatments and new hope for every form of cancer. At the James, you're making the choice to have the most advanced treatments, many of which were developed right here. And you're choosing access to the James world-class clinical trials, dedicated support services, and an unmatched survivorship program to support your life after cancer treatment. You didn't choose cancer, but the choice of where to treat it is clear. We're back with Electra Paskett, one of the world's leading cancer epidemiologists. And you just filled us in on one big statewide program, Turning the Page on Breast Cancer. Well, I know, I know there's a lot more, but we have a limited amount of time. So why don't you tell, tell us about two more of your bigger programs? So one of them um, involve, is a statewide initiative that involves a statewide cancer coalition, the Ohio Partners for Cancer Control. I am involved in that, as are several of my staff. And during the pandemic, a lot of people put off cancer screenings. Right. So um, I started thinking, what can we do to get back to screenings? So with Di Crawford, um, who uh, uh, leads a local cervical cancer advocate group, the Crawford Crew, um, we, I came to this idea that we should do something statewide through the Ohio Partners for Cancer Control called Get Back to Basics Ohio. And um, I borrowed the Get Back to Basics from Di, but she's, she's one of the co-leads of the who's, OPCC. Who's Di? Di Crawford. Oh, oh, I, I just oh I'm sorry. Her. Okay. Yeah. I thought this, I heard it differently. <laughs> okay. Di Crawford. Di yeah. Crawford. Diane Crawford, yes. So um, so Case is working with us on this, and it has launched, and every month we focus on a different cancer that we all need to get back to. This month, well, it's December now, but in November, for example, we focused on lung cancer, both uh, cessation, smoking cessation, and lung cancer screening. 
And uh, of course, October was breast cancer. Uh, December, we are going to focus on all the screening tests because starting the week of December 5th is cancer screening week. So every you know week, there are different posts that are put on Facebook, for example, that focus on each of these different cancer sites. So it's kind of exciting that we're having uh, such a big reach uh, with this message to get back to screening. Yeah, and I think that a lot of smokers don't realize the importance of lung cancer screening and that now with the advances in treatment caught early, you can live exactly. for a long time. Exactly. And that, and that there's, well, you know better than me, it's like if you smoke for X amount of years, certain amount of cigarettes, you qualify, you should get a screening. Exactly. Even if you don't have symptoms, catch it early. I mean, you're going to save so many lives. Right. And we are seeing uh, the lung cancer death rates turn around, both because of cessation, screening, and these improved treatments. You know, it's just a game changer, total game changer. And... Um, Unfortunately, the lung cancer screening rate is only between three and five percent of the eligible people. of the eligible people yeah. in the United States. So we got to get on that. And how much are there's numbers on what percent screenings went down during COVID and how many deaths that could could relate to five, ten, fifteen there years? There are from now? there are numbers, and the former director of the National Cancer Institute, uh, Dr. Norman Sharpless. Uh, during the pandemic, gave a, a presentation, also wrote an editorial. They expect 10,000 excess deaths because of lack of screening during the pandemic. So for you, when you hear that number, wh- how do you react? I cringe. You know, I'm, a, I'm a three-time breast cancer survivor. Right. So two of my three were found by a mammogram. And uh, so screening is very important to me, Yes. Yeah, but you cringe and then you get to work? We get to work. So Though that's one of the reasons yeah. we did this OPCC, Get Back to Basics Ohio. Yeah, that and again, you, you, you said it started with someone connected with cervical cancer, and that's the pap test is so... Well, let's, let's, we call it cervical cancer screening now. Oh, it's, okay, sorry. Because Cerv- it's, that- a, it's a combination of uh, uh, HPV testing oh. and... The pap test. So it's even more effective. Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's a perfect example of what an epidemiologist does and how it saves lives. So what's one more of your many programs? So this is an exciting study. It was funded by the National Cancer Institute, and uh, I did this with uh, um, Indiana University, a colleague from there, Dr. Victoria Champion. And um, she had done a prior study where she tested um, a tailored interactive DVD in Indianapolis with black women to try to get them uh, breast cancer screening. So with how the DVD works is when you put it in the machine, you use the TV controllers, and you can select, uh, say for breast screening, you can select why you haven't gotten one. And then there's a recorded message addressing that barrier. Oh, for example, you put in, I have no health insurance. Yes. There's no center with that I can get to. Right, right. So what, what uh, Vicki and I did, she um, modified the DVD uh, to focus on rural women. And we also included not only breast cancer, but cervical and colon screening. And uh, so we developed this tailored interactive DVD, and we tested in rural women from Indiana and Ohio whether women who received just the DVD got more up to date with any of the needed screening tests they needed or all. So we call this bundling because we focused on three cancers at once. Or if we added telephonic patient navigation to the DVD, how much did that improve? Where they could connect instantly to someone. Well, or the navigator called them. Called, okay. Yeah. So we, um, so I, you know, I have the navigation program. I have done navigation for a long time in my shop and we have it down pat. So um, we recruited 
uh, almost a thousand women who lived in 96 rural counties across Indiana and Ohio. So we recruited from every rural county. There are 98, but we only got participants from 96. And uh, so the women then uh, were randomized to receive either arm. And we uh, made sure they needed the test by looking at medical records. We got medical record release for them to do that. And then they were in the program for 12 months. And then we looked again at their, their medical records to see if they had gotten any of the tests they needed or all the tests they needed. And uh, we found that uh, compared to getting nothing, which was no DVD, the, the third arm, getting the, no DVD or patient navigation, the women who got the DVD were significantly more likely to, to get both up to date with all the screening tests they need as well as any tests they needed. However, adding the patient navigation to that, to the DVD, was superior. And um, we, uh, I presented the results at the World Cancer Congress in Geneva last month, and it was picked up on ASCO Post and several places, the results. And uh, we have one paper that's been published online focusing on just a mammography. And our outcome paper with all three screening tests is under review now at, at a journal. So does that mean by doing this successfully and getting the word out to all the other leaders that others will mimic what you do? Yes. And a couple of things about this study. First of all, everything was done remotely. So COVID didn't right. in, yeah. impinge upon us yeah. delivering the intervention. So you mail them the DVD? Mail them the DVD. The women were recruited mainly through Facebook. Oh. Huh. And then uh, we, we would call them to assure eligibility, do the survey. They did remote consenting and uh, uh, returned the medical record form, the signed medical record form. And then they were mailed the DVD or the telephonic you know, patient navigation. So it was all done remotely. So it could be adapted in, in many settings, especially in, in rural communities. Yeah. Um, and so I was just at a meeting the last two days in D.C. for another study we're working on. It's one of the Moonshot Initiatives, um, accelerating colorectal cancer screening and follow-up using uh, through implementation science. And the, uh, the, the investigators, we had an investigator meeting, a lot of them were talking about bundling. They were saying that, you know, the federally qualified health centers that all of us work with were really wanting to do bundling. They didn't just want to focus on colon. They went about, So I said, hey, you know, <laughs> yeah, this... we just did this successful intervention. It could easily be adapted and disseminated, you know, elsewhere. We would like to move the DVD to web-based. Uh, the reason we chose DVD back in the day when we did this was we didn't feel that web presence was so great among the counties that we were focusing on. There still is a digital div divide. Uh, so that's why we went to DVD. And very few women, uh, in fact, no, none of the women said they didn't have a DVD. Some of them uh, said their DVD didn't work <laughs> after they got, that's why they didn't watch the DVD, but virtually we never got, I don't have access to a DVD, because we would mail them one if they needed it. A DVD player? Yes, <laughs> and get it back. Can, yes. I get, can I get one? I don't have one. <laughs> Study's <laughs> over. In, okay. <laughs> so, um, so the, the, you know, that, that's, that's kind of exciting that we could think about... Um, disseminating this and gearing up. So it sounds like to me, this is the equivalent of a, it is a clinical trial. It works. Let's expand it nationally. Right. So. Right. And we were talking about that yesterday in our meetings. You know, uh, some of the federally qualified health centers, their metrics of success or performance metrics are based on the percentage of their uh, patient population who are up to date in screening. And could this be something that could help them. Okay. So rise, that sounds fascinating. Let's, I know you always have lots of things. If you could briefly talk about a couple things that are either in the works, in the pipeline that are going to start in the next year or two, or even further down the road that 
you're just haven't quite got the the funding or or everything put in place yet what's what's down the road well we just talked about disseminating the rise intervention so that's but a, okay. um, i will tell you we were just awarded a grant from the national cancer institute so we were a, one of four clinical centers in a national cancer institute sponsored initiative called cusp to ct cusp to ct right and the goal is to increase the accrual of underrepresented minorities and other populations onto clinical trials. Oh, okay. So I we're just that. kicking off. They're having a big kickoff meeting sometime in December, and uh, so we're just we're just getting started on that. I've heard about that. That the number of minorities in clinical trials is historically and currently really low. It is, and that that uh, doesn't lead to that slows things down and, right. and hurts people. How do we know that everything works yeah. in, uh, unless we test it in all populations? So the groups that are traditionally underrepresented in clinical research are women, minorities, both racial and ethnic minorities, rural populations. Um, and across the lifespan, we look at the adults and young, young adolescents and young adults with cancer, and then the older, over 65. So those populations are traditionally underrepresented in um, clinical research. So the health equity aspect of epidemiology and what you do is, is growing. It is. It is. But we've always, uh, in the Center for Cancer Health Equity, we have always had a focus on increasing accrual. And, um, you know, uh, we've tripled it since I've come here. But when you start very low and you triple, that's still not where you want to be. So we've implemented several strategies, including uh, having translation services, working very closely with the translation services here at the Wexner Medical Center um, and our uh, navigation. But, you know, we have limited funds. And so this will give us a, a few more positions that we can actually work extremely closely with the wonderful clinical trial office, which we've already started to, to implement what I um, developed, which is called the accrual enhancement protocol. And uh, that's what we're going to implement. And we're hiring extra staff so that we can do that. So you, you mentioned funding. And it seems to me, tell me if I'm right, that in the past, that funding for underrepresented group, underrepresented groups was harder the very nature of they're underrepresented. How do you get funding? It's slowly, not quickly enough, but slowly turning around, and you're leading that charge. Trying to lead. Okay. One of the leaders, right. yes. Right. The other area um, is I have a dream, and I don't, I'm not the only one with this dream. Uh, it comes from the World Health Organization, which is to eliminate cervical cancer. And uh, several years ago, the World Health Organization uh, came up with the three pillars that we need, which is increase uh, HPV vaccination, increase cervical cancer screening, and um, a sure follow-up of abnormals. So um, a team uh, uh, from the Big Ten Cancer Research Consortium, which Ohio State is a, a part of, we uh, have submitted a couple of grants looking at um, implementing a, a, a strategy to eliminate cervical cancer in the Big Ten, focusing on minority underserved populations who bear the biggest brunt of cervical cancer. So when you say eliminate it, so the HPV, a woman who gets the HPV vaccination is vaccinated. She won't get it. For women who don't, the, will the screening prevent it or just catch it in the earliest stages when the success rate can be like 95 or the above? The screening can identify early abnormalities that can be treated. Like that can pre-cancerous polyps uh, in the colon, that same concept? That or? same concept, yes. And so, that can treat the cervical abnormalities to prevent developing invasive cervical cancer. So little by little as you get more women to get the HPV and more screened, you can bring that yes. number down to, yes. to zero. Yes, but it has to be both. Vaccination, because remember, we mostly yeah. vote, Vac yes. vaccinate Gotta the young, yeah. and then um, screening. And even if you're vaccinated, you still need to get a screening, screening test. 
Okay. Um, and But the big problem is the follow-up of abnormals. So I did my doctoral dissertation looking at why women with abnormal, at back then it was only PAP, abnormal PAPs uh, don't come back for follow-up. And back then it was about Fear. only 60% came back for the right and the, the timely follow-up. That rate has not changed since then. Wow. Is it's, it they're scared? They it, don't want to know? That's part of it. That's part of it. Yeah. They don't understand. Um, a lot, a lot of different reasons. A lot of different reasons. And cost is a huge problem. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about the cost. So for many years, we had the problem that if you had an abnormal stool blood test for colon cancer screening, then the follow-up is a colonoscopy, and that became a diagnostic colonoscopy, and it cost a lot of money, whether you had to pay for that out of pocket or you had to pay a large copay. So it took 10 years to get what we call the donut hole fixed. So now if you have an abnormal fit, you don't have to pay that exorbitant out-of-pocket cost, whatever, for a colonoscopy. The donut hole still exists for an abnormal mammogram or clinical breast exam and an abnormal pap. You have to pay extra. You pay for the follow-up. Uh, yeah. It costs. It costs, uh, well. it costs a lot out of pocket. And so that, we've got to fix a that. That is a big barrier. That's a huge barrier, unless there are programs that can help cover that. And uh, fortunately, in Ohio, we have the Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program that can pay for that cost, both of the initial mammogram or PAP or HPV screening test and the follow-up. But not everybody qualifies for that. And so thus the donut hole. And uh, we have to get lobbying to get that fixed. That's the only way that's going to get fixed because that's what happened with the colon cancer donut hole. So wow. that's a huge, huge problem. So I can, I can hear your determination and passion and you talked a little bit about the reason why your own cancer journey, but why, what drives you to, to say, you know, what we're doing now isn't enough. We have to do more. I'm, I'm not going to stop. <laughs> well, because people are still dying from cancer yeah. and there's still disparities. And, you know, the other thing is if I can give a message of hope because I'm a three-time breast cancer survivor. Can I be, you know, a message of hope to people that even if you do, if you have to hear those words, you have cancer, that there is hope. There, yes, you're definitely proof of that, and you're giving others hope. So thank you. Thank you for everything you do, and good luck on, on these programs. Thank and, you. And I'm very curious down the road to see what else you're going to come up with. Thank you, Steve. Thanks very much. This podcast is brought to you by the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center, Arthur G. James Cancer Hospital, and Richard J. Solov Research Institute. For more information, check out our website, cancer.osu.edu.